Yes. Oh, look what I got you. I got gotcha. you. No, my kids would love that, Ethan, unfortunately. I've, yes, yes. Okay, oh, I've got papers. I've got papers. Um, okay. Let me give these back. Um, so let me sit here. Let me close this off because I'm loud. Um, I really want you to pay attention to the comments I make on your paper. And this is because you can use, you can use them on your next paper, right? So if I say things like, are you guys listening? If I say things like, um, you know, it, your writing is great, but it would be awesome if you, you know, used a specific example or a quote. You know, think about doing that next time. Um, if I say, this is a good start, but maybe you should fill this idea out a little bit, um, use that information. But while I pass these out, please, if there's anything, if I went through and altered any grammar, you know, um, should I not see Rhett today? He's uh, this is for grade. Oh, why? Oh, it was stuck to the back oh, of yours. <laughs> oh. I will just, I will just, I'll just hold on to it. Um, okay, I do, I do have a no name here. Hey, hey. I have a no name. Is Beowulf truly the legend the stories make him out to be? Does this sound like the title of anybody's paper? I think it's odd when no one wants to claim something. Oh, well, you're not raising it very high. That's the problem. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Is that all yours? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Do I have a ask me? Oh, huh. oh, I think it's the same. I think it's the same. Oh, okay. So do you see that this is not a complete sentence? Is something that says some of which are his duty as a leader. This turns into be a which clause. It's just kind of a genitive. It's a possessive which clause. So some of these are. Then, then you're okay with the semicolon there. All right. Is there anybody else that I said ask me? Because I felt like someone else did this too. It's my favorite thing to talk about. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Do you mind, ladies, if I read your what you wrote? Okay. So. When we start a sentence with an ing word, the, and there's two ing words. Some ing words are called gerunds. They're nouns. Um, it's the subject of the sentence. For example, um, running makes me tired. What makes me tired? running. It's the subject of the sentence. It's acting like a noun. But sometimes I use it as an adjective. Running down the street, I fell into a hole, right? Looking out the window, I see a car. And it's the looking or the running is describing I. It's telling I'm an I who's running. I'm an I who's looking. The lovely problem that arises when we use these is that if the subject of the sentence is not the inger, you get something sort of ludicrous. For example, running down the street, the trees were all flowering. Who's running down the street? The trees. The trees are now running, which is, just entertains me to no end. Um, looking out the window, the car is in the parking lot. Who's looking out the window? Car. The car is now looking out the window. So whenever we start a sentence with one of these ings, the main sentence that begins, the subject of it has to be doing the inging. So we will just, for humor's sake, although everybody can do this, and you did volunteer that I could do this. Reading through the poem 
he makes great heroic acts. Who's reading through the poem? Apparently Beowulf. Reading through the poem, he makes great heroic acts. We, the subject can't be he. It has to be the person reading through the poem. Reading through the poem, I can see many hero heroic acts of Beowulf, right? Reading through the poem, uh, audiences are delighted with Beowulf's uh, exploits, right? And um, Ella's was, uh, this one was the one that I found great humor in, and I'm not laughing at you, I promise. I always laugh. These are called dangling participles. Oh. Oh, oh, okay. Um, oh, yes, okay. So it's it's actually Hannah's then that caused me great joy. Um, these are called dangling participles, but I've always loved them because I get a picture of it in my head. So if you don't mind, here we go. After ripping Grindel's arm off, his mother was out for revenge. I rest my case. Um, I just feel like that's the meanest thing I have ever heard. Oh my gosh. So be careful with participles, starting sentences, because they can inadvertently cause great joy to your reader. Um, you don't mean them to. Um, I have, what? It really is more fun. I when I just have always loved these for whatever reason. When I was a kid and I was in school, you know, when I was in high school or something, which I, you know, we still do them even in high school, but we had these boring grammar books, you know, and they would have all these, you know, find out which one is incorrect and put a circle at whatever. But anyway, my problem was I would read them and then I would start laughing because I could see it. I could see Grindel's mom ripping her own son's arm off or, you know, you know, driving down the street you know, flowers were popping up everywhere. Like, and so I would laugh and all, all of the other people in the class would look at me funny because I was laughing out loud. And I'd say, what? It's funny. It's funny. Think about it. It was not real popular in high school. Okay. Um, I have two very interesting pictures for us to look at today. They are both from Charlemagne's time, both made during Charlemagne's lifetime. And they are in uh, collections of uh, Gospels. I noticed we've talked about Psalters and, and, and collections of Gospels. You know, Bibles are fat. Can, Bibles are big, right? And so, and so they put it on very skinny paper often, you know, especially if there's lots of notes. So often they would just take collections. There would be a Psalm book. There would be just a collection of the Gospels. It's a much more manageable book especially if you're using parchment or, you know, um, something thicker like that. So these were just gospels. And these are both pictures of Matthew. Um, and I'm going to walk around because it's worth looking at them. Um, w one of them, okay, this one, I will I'll walk around. This one is rather tame. And it's notable because this is how in the Roman world they often pictured writers or scholars. They always have this little stand here and they're writing and they're sitting at the table and you can see their leg off to the side. We have pictures of Augustine like this. You know, this was a thing. This one, I, I don't know. This looks like some Picasso thing going on to me. Like not Picasso, uh, I don't know, not Van Gogh. It's very modern. Yeah, yeah I, it's very modern art looking. But and and we have no we have no source for this like what 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 was going on but it's just I like it because it's just full of energy. Do we have a, an, an area where both of them were in in France both during yes France? yes these were both commissioned commissioned under Charlemagne. This one the weird one made for Archbishop Ebo. Uh, circa eight sixteen to eight thirty five. It's really, I've never seen anything else like it. It's just every, I, I know, but I still like it, even though it makes me wrinkle my nose up like that. So and this one, the one that's a little tamer, is called the Coronation Gospels. It was actually, we know, produced for Charlemagne's court. 
Charlemagne probably looked at this. Um, but do you see it's the same pose? We've, we've got the same, we've got the same exact pose, but why this this artist decided to do the wavy, the wavy line thing? It really, it really looks like it ought to be some modern. <laughs> got a lot of lines, a lot of lines. And then I'm not going to come around again, but I should have. And they said, we know, we know that it's Matthew. Matthew's, hey guys, shh. Matthew's symbol. Are you familiar with the idea that each of the gospel writers has an animal or a symbol? Okay, so Matthew's symbol is man, and then they said. Uh, we, we know this because of the man um, up in the corner. I'm looking at it. looks like a badger. It looks like a huge, like it makes me think of wind in the willows. It looks like a huge badger. I know. I, I don't know what's going on there, but all I can say is Charlemagne had some highly creative minds working on art in his court. Um, anyway, inter interesting. Uh, Many people talk about the time of Charlemagne as a mini Renaissance. They refer to it as the Carolingian Renaissance, Car Carolus Charles. So that dynasty of his is the Carolingian dynasty. <clears throat> and that because of art and learning and all of these things, there were some really interesting things going on. So that is our art of the week. Charlemagne probably saw with his own eyes both of those, both of those gospels. All right, let's dig into the Song of Roland. I also want to take a little bit of time to get you ready for what we're going to read next for the for the next two weeks up until Thanksgiving break. Can you believe we meet two more times and then it's Thanksgiving break? That's crazy. Um, and I, so I want to talk a little bit about the Crusades, just a little introduction to the Crusades. So let's take a look where we left off. When we left off, when last we saw Roland, he was bleeding in the brain from blowing a horn too hard <laughs> and probably not going to make it. But no one's going to kill him. No one kills Roland, right? He dies of his, his injury. Um, after, after cutting off Marsilion's right hand, which is very poetic justice, since he said, we're going to cut off Charlemagne's right-hand man, Roland, and also killing Marcelian's son. These seem to be his last deeds. And uh, in Lays 143, it says, Marcel has taken flight. That's it. I am bleeding, possibly to death. My son is dead. Uh, and... There's only one guy left. No, Oliver's still left. I think at some point it says there are three. Oh, here we go. And lays 152. Um, or ever Roland comes to himself again and has recovered and rallied from his faint, fearful disaster his fortunes have sustained. All of the French are lost to him and slain. Soul, the Archbishop, and Walter Hum remain. Roland, the Archbishop, and Walter Hum are the only three living of the 20,000. Yes. <laughs> My favorite part about this story is how many people they kill. Like this guy who is stuck through with lances and with arrows in like 13 different places, I think they said, or like it was numbers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, lances. I think it's the Archbishop, too. Oh, okay. And this guy is riding around. Killing 400 people? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was the Archbishop. 400. I made a note. Um, oh, yeah. Here it's, yes. Very good remembering. Um, he looks on Roland and runs to him and says, only one word. I am not beaten yet. True man failed never while life in him was left. He draws Al Mace, his steel bright brand keen edged. A thousand strokes he strikes amid the press. Soon Charles shall see he spared no foe he met. For all about him, he'll find 400 men, some wounded, some clean through body cleft, and some of them made shorter by the head. <laughs> I like that. 
Um, yeah, these guys are amazing, but they're all going down and it's Oliver's turn. It's Oliver's turn. Roland is fierce, but Oliver is wise. Um, but wisdom can't help when there's five to one odds. Eventually you're all going to get taken out. And uh, uh, one of the um, Saracens comes and from behind deals Oliver a blow. Deep in his back, the burnished mail is broke, but the spear point stands forth at his breastbone. So, 149. See Roland now swooning in saddle laid, and Oliver that unto death is maimed. He's bled so much that his eyes are all glazed, or far or near he can see nothing straight, nor recognize a single living shape. So when he comes to where his comrade waits, on the gold helm, he smites at him amain. Down to the nasal, he splits the jeweled plates, only his head is not touched by the blade. Roland comes to see his friend as he's dying. His friend has gone blind from loss of blood, and he hits Roland, thinking it's an enemy coming after him. I mean, Oliver never gives up. He's dying, and he just whacks. Then Roland, stricken, lifts his eyes to his face, asking him lowly and mildly as he may, Sir, my companion, did you mean it that way? Look, I am Roland that loved you all my days. You never sent me challenge or battle gauge. You didn't tell me we were having an argument. Quoth Oliver, I cannot see you plain. I know your voice. May God see you and save. And I have struck you. Pardon it me, I pray. Roland replies, I have taken no scathe. I pardon you myself and in God's name. Then each other to bows courteous, then each to other bows courteous in his place with such great love, thus is their parting made. And he says in 151, now thou art dead, I grieve to be alive. But he's got to keep trying as long as there's any hope, as long as he has breath in his body. Um, where does, oh, no, no, I don't want to do that yet. Um, I didn't ask you this question, but maybe you remember. Where does Roland go to die? Not after he dies. I asked you after he dies, but where does Roland go as he knows he's about to die? He does something specifically. Do you know what it is, Matthew? He went to a stone. I think it was just a stone that was in the field. And do you remember what he wanted to do on it? Jonathan. Try to, break his sword. Try to break his sword. Like, I don't want anyone using you ever again. Somebody, you know, he was kind of passed out. And somebody, he felt somebody trying to steal his sword. One of the Saracens was like, no, killed him. And says, I, I'm going to bash my sword against the stone until it breaks, so no one can use you again. I don't want any of these these Turks, these Saracens getting getting my sword. But here's, here's what he does. He goes to a certain place. It tells us several times. Okay, in Lays 168, it says, far as a quarrel, that's an arrow, far as a quarrel flies from a crossbow drawn toward land of Spain, he goes. So remember the line, they're all leaving Spain and Roland stumbles back backwards towards the way they came. You might not know why, but then it tells us in 174, now Roland feels death press upon him hard. It's creeping down from his head to his heart. Under a pine tree, he hastens him apart. There stretches him face down on the green grass and lays beneath him his sword and oliphant. He's turned his head to where the paintings are. And this he doth for the French and for Charles, since fain is he that they should say, brave heart, that he has died a conqueror at the last. He's purposely going towards the enemy, but we need one more lays to fill in the detail. And it is 204. 
Charlemagne comes to the scene of the carnage and he says, Roland said something, which now I call to mind, that should he come in foreign lands to die, beyond them all, footmen or peers, he'd lie and have his face turned toward the enemy. Fighting, he'd fall and finish victor-like. He told Charlemagne a long time ago, he said, you know what? If you ever come to a battlefield and we're all dead, you can look for me out beyond the rest towards the enemy. You will find me towards the enemy. This is how they know where, because 20,000 bodies is a lot of bodies to look through, right? They find Roland pretty fast. They find him pretty fast because Charlemagne said, oh, I remember. He told me, he told me he'd wander out beyond the rest towards the enemy, if at all possible, and fall there fighting. Roland screwed up, not well on that horn, but he's pretty awesome. Where does he go when he dies? He goes straight to heaven. And at the end of 176, um, the county soul, it has Gabriel, ba they bear to paradise. Roland does something a little odd in 174, 75, and 76. It's one of those repeat things. It says, um, the last two lines of 174, he beats his breast full many a time and fast, gives with his glove his sins into God's charge. And then the end of 175, his right hand glove he unto God extends, angels from heaven now to his side descend. And the end of 176, or not quite to the end, his right hand glove he's tendered unto Christ, and from his hand Gabriel accepts the sign. When did we see someone being given a glove before? What? Yeah, G Ganelon. Yeah, when Ganelon goes and they're sending him to the, the Saracen camp, the Saracen town, Saragossa, and they said, okay, take the glove and wand, the signs of you being invested with authority. These are the signs that I've given to you authority. I've given you something that you're mine. Roland's dying. And he gives his glove to God. What's he giving back? What, what's, what's the glove represent? His duty. His duty, his authority, his life. You gave this to me on a loan. You invested me with authority when you created me <laughs> to be a human being and be loyal and trustworthy and faithful. And now you're calling it back. The job's done. You know, when you've gone on your gone on your mission and you come back, you give it back to the Lord. I love that part. He gives his glove back to God because his authority is done. He's getting called home and he knows it. Um, what happened when Ganelon, what did they say Ganelon did with the glove? What it happened when Charlemagne gave him the glove? Does anybody remember? He did, but something happened to the glove. What did it happen, Charlie? He dropped it. He dropped his insignia of authority on the ground. Do you see any symbol in there? Roland holds on to his and gives it back to God. Ganelon takes it, but the authority, the authority to be loyal and trustworthy and everything. Oops. Oops, I dropped it on the ground. And everybody, it says in the poem, everybody said, oh, this is a bad sign. It's a bad omen. And then actually Roland razzes him at one point later. He says, what, you think I'm going to drop it like you dropped it? You know, Roland needs to just be quiet sometimes, maybe. But very nice. This tells us a little bit about people in the Middle Ages, doesn't it? How did they see life, our lives? We are on, they are on loan to us from God. 
Everything we have is on loan to us and we will give it back someday. Um, and uh, in Hamlet, you know, a line from Hamlet, the readiness, the readiness is all. Being ready to give it back, right? Whenever, whenever we're called, give that glove back. Your authority is ended. I'm recalling you. Okay. So Char, uh, Roland is dead. He's in heaven. Charlemagne shows up and um, it's too late. Just like Archbishop Turpin said it would be. But here's the second question I asked you. Um, how does Charlemagne react? How is, what is he described as doing in the poem? He plucks his beard, which seems a little odd, but this was a thing, you know, inflicting pain on yourself. Um, what else does he do? Does anybody see anything? Um, yeah, well, let's 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 hit that one in a moment. Um, what what is his emotional reaction? I guess maybe I should say it like that. Okay, he's very angry. Um, anything else? What does he What does he physically do? I mean, maybe it's too easy a question. Yeah. He, he cried. Uh, let me read what I'm, I'm thinking of. In 184, um, Charles lies awake and weeps for Roland's plight. For Oliver, he weeps with all his might. Um, and later on, it says, The king is weary, for grief weighs on his eyes. But then on, it's 205 to 210. I've confused myself by writing page numbers and lays numbers down. Um, 205, the last line, he swoons upon him. What does it mean to swoon? What? Sorry. Faint. Faint. He passes out from grief. 206, last line, King Carlon swoons. He cannot help himself. And then, if that's not enough, at the end of 209, and of the French, a hundred thousand swoon. This is from grief. And and he says in 210, Roland, my friend, God bring thee to his rest and set thy soul in paradise the blessed. He that slew thee hath ruined France as well. So great my grief, I would that I were dead. We expect Charlemagne to be sorry. I don't know if I expect him to cry his eyes out and pass out. But is Charlemagne painted in this poem to be, uh, I don't know, I no offense to the girls here, but girly, do you know what I mean? Like highly sensitive and sappy and emotional. He doesn't seem like the sort. And you know what, I asked you this question and I'm bringing it up because we have a really different idea of how we should show our grief and behave. You guys know this, uh, or different than the Middle Ages, different than the past. You guys know this because in the Bible, in the Old Testament, what do they do when they're grieving? What do they uh, tear their clothes and yeah, well, uh, yeah. I mean, Job tears his clothes, and there's something else they on their heads. They're always doing something on their heads. Sprinkle ashes or dust on their heads, and this is very extreme. Do you know what I mean? It's very dramatic. I'm in grief. I'm tearing the clothes that I'm wearing. I'm I'm ripping them, and I'm and handfuls of dust on my head. But it was the way they showed they were grieving. They didn't think it was extreme. They weren't trying to be. This is how we grieve. And in the Middle Ages, we didn't have such a code of men don't ball their eyes out and swoon over their loved ones. We're an oddity in history, maybe. And, you know, we talk about men not showing their feelings or whatever. I don't think any of us do. Not like the past, you know. It was very, it was very open. People were very open about these things. And, I don't know, it's just another way medieval people are different from us. Charlemagne passes out. A hundred thousand of them pass out, and nobody thinks it's odd. Like, yeah, sure. Yeah, I know. That's what happens when, you know. Terrible things happen to you. This is the reaction. 
So Charlemagne and his men grieve horribly. Now let's go back, Ethan, you mentioned 179. The next question I asked you was, what does Charlemagne ask God for as he seeks vengeance and does God, you read it. I wanted to read it anyway, so you go for it. Yes. An angel with whom he wants to talk comes with um, comes with this summons in answer to his call. Ride, Harlan, ride the light shall come mm -hmm. short. The flower of France is fallen. God knows all. Thou shalt thou shalt have vengeance upon the heathen horde. When this he hears, the emperor gets a horse. What did he ask for? He asked for some, God to do some a specific miracle, though. I want the sun to stand still. Who, who else asked for the sun to stand still? Joshua. Joshua. Oh, sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you know until we until we avenge ourselves on our enemies, and yeah, Charlemagne and everybody reading this poem would know that. Oh, yeah. Because the only case ever recorded that we know of, of the sun not following its regular course, is Joshua. Except for Hezekiah. Do you remember Hezekiah had a, do you remember what Hezekiah asked for? <laughs> I won't leave you in suspense. Um, Hezekiah was dying, and Isaiah came and said, you're dying. And, and Hezekiah was, you know, kind of burned about that because he'd been, he'd been a really good king. He's like, oh God, really? I'm going to die? And 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 can I not, you know, have a longer life? And and Isaiah wasn't even very far gone. And God says, oh yeah, Isaiah, go back to Hezekiah and tell him, yeah, I'm going to give him, I think it's 15 more years of life. Uh, and as a sign, the shadow, as, as the sun moves through the window and the shadow that goes down the stairs, it will go backwards. I'll make everything, I'll reverse the shadow and it will go backwards up the stairs. So I think that's more, even more awesome than sun standing still. It's actually going backwards. Anyway. Um, <laughs> why is the shadow going backwards? Or whether it just happened for Hezekiah and it didn't happen for everyone else. Don't know. But um, yeah, so everybody would know these stories and they'd read that like, shoot, Charlemagne's like one of the great Old Testament heroes. He's awesome. He says, God, make the sun stand still. And it does. It does. 180, it says, the sun stood still in the midheaven Holden um, until he can chase all the, the Saracens down. Um, yeah, go ahead. In bead, are we thinking in bead? Yes, it was um, a king whose name started with E. That guy. <laughs> that guy. It was a Erdred. Erdred. There were Edwin. 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 It is Edwin. That's much more normal than the things I was speculating on. Um, okay, I. I am only mentioning this because it's cool. It probably has some deep significance, but I think it's just cool. Did you notice anything? Oh, oh no, I, did. I asked the question. What is special about Charlemagne's sword? I did ask the question because it's so cool. There's two things, actually. It's in 183. Oh. Okay, I'm, re I'm reading it. And girt about him, joyous, his peerless blade that changes color full 30 times a day. What? what? It's like a mood. He's got a mood sword or something. It changes color? Okay, but wait, there's more. You know the lance, for oft we've heard the tale which pierced our Lord when he on cross was slain. Carlon possesses the lance head. God be praised. In the gold pummel, he's had it shrined and encased. He's carrying around the spearhead that stabbed Jesus. 
and it changes color 30 times a day. I don't know what to say about that. And for to honor such favor and such grace, this sword of his is called joyous by name. Wherefore, no nation can stand before their face. Yes. Well, where else? What other popular story series do we see a lot of named swords in? Lord of the Rings. We have Sting. We have um, what? Oh, yes, they, in Aragon, they, oh, in the, yes, people did name, the, I think we should start naming our objects. You know, I had friends that named their cars, like, like one of them was called Clifford, like named, named their cars. It was not, oddly. Um, uh, so anyway, I just think that it's a cool, maybe you should consider some of your personal possessions giving them a name who how does how does it hurt um i want to read the rest of 184 i read a little bit of it about the king being weary and he can't sleep for grief there's not a horse has strength to stand upright if they want grass they crop it as they lie he that has suffered learns many things in life Charlemagne and his men have suffered. Charlemagne's 200 years old, for crying out loud. You don't get to be 200 years old and not suffer something. He that has suffered learns many things in life. I'm just going to let you think about that for the rest of the day. Um, so, Mar Marcillion, Marcel has has gone all the way back to Saragossa with his bleeding stump of an arm, right? And we find out in 189 that seven years ago, seven years ago, he sent a message to Babylon saying, Charlemagne and the Franks are ravaging my lands. I do not know why it took this man seven years to show up. It is a long way. And they did have to gather troops. It took him seven years. But he finally shows up. Now, Balagant. Yes, in the first year, letters went out from him to Balagant in Babylon. This guy finally shows up and lands. And he's the typical, you know, you call for outside help. You're like, okay, okay, I got this. I'm here. Here, I'm here. Everybody, fine. We got this under control. I know exactly what we need to do. We're going to take care of this right away. And he starts giving orders. And he has no clue what the situation is. He says, um, pretty far towards the end of 193. All right. Go tell, to tell this to Marcillion tell, that to his aid I've come against the French. Great war I'll wage, where'er I light on them. Give him this folded glove with golden hems on his right hand. Make sure you see it set. What's the problem with that? He doesn't have a right hand. Give him this wand of purest gold as well. Bid him come seek me and hear his fealty pledge. I go to France to fight Charles to the death. If at my feet he bow not down the neck, if he renounce not the faith of Christian men, then will I take the crown from off his head. The Paynims say, sir, this is right well said. You know, because they're the guys who say whatever their boss wants them to say. Hey, this guy knows nothing. He doesn't know anything. Charlemagne is on the warpath. Get out of his way. He's very upset. He has lost so many men, not to mention that they flat out lied to him and then ambush his men. Oh, he's not leaving before they pay. And this guy's like, oh, oh, go put that glove on his right hand. Missing. And I'm just going to go fight Charlemagne. Good luck with that. Because you have no idea what you're stepping into. Yeah, like Charlemagne's ever going to do that. The guy who's carrying around the, the, the spear point from the crucifixion. 
like he's going to do that. Oh, oh no. He's saying I go to France to fight Charles. Okay. Charles to the death. If he at my feet. Yeah. Which makes it even more ridiculous. Like Charles is, or like Charlemagne's never going to do that. He goes to Bramimond. Bramimond is Mrs. Marcillion. Right? Her son is dead. Her husband is laying there bleeding. And messengers from Balagant come and say, uh, uh, in 195, now may Mayhound, you know, Muhammad, may Mayhound that hath us in his safeguard, and Lord Apollyon and Termagant, which favor, protect the king and to the queen be gracious. Basically, they come in and say, oh, oh, may Muhammad and the gods, may Allah be, be good to you. Because they don't know what's going on. Here's her answer. Quoth Bramimond, why, there's a foolish saying. These gods of ours are miserable traitors. They have worked wonders at Roncevaux, the caitiffs. They let our knights be slaughtered there unaided. As for my lord, they've utterly betrayed him. His right hand's gone. There's not a doit remaining, not a finger remaining. Was twas smitten off by Roland, the Count Makeless. Now Charlemagne has all Spain for the taking. And what of me, forlorn and wretched lady? Woe worth the day. Why is there none to slay me? She's ripe for what happens later, isn't she? She ends up submitting to Charlemagne and saying, yes, I will go to your capital. I will become a Christian. Her gods, her Allah, Muhammad, they have let her down. You know what? I'm going over to the gods of the winning side. And she does. It doesn't seem quite as odd when you read that and think she's already disillusioned. She's already understanding that the Christian God is the winner here. All right. Um, let, I'm looking at the time, trying to think what I want to talk about later. Um, Let's, oh, let's, we can't leave this part out. Balagant doesn't really believe anyone about the situation. And so, nope, I'm, I got this. I got Charlemagne. Bring him on, bring him on. And in 228, they meet. And the, the emir, Balagant, is, is described. The great emir is foremost of them all. He dons a Bernie whose skirts are saffron d'or. He's laced his helm with gems and gold adorned. To his left side, he's girded on his sword. In his great pride, he's found a name, therefore, to vie with Carlon's, of which he's heard men talk. It bears a title, Precious. Precious. Oh, it's his precious. That's disturbing. The, the blade, is, blade is called. Um, and then skipping down. Now, Balagant mounts up upon his horse. Marcule of Outremer, his stirrup caught. Stalwart is he, capacious in the fork, large in the ribs, lean in the flanks and small. Broad is his breast and beautifully formed, his shoulders wide, his color fresh withal. Warlike his bearing, his curling locks unshorn, white as a flower upon a summer's morn, his valor proved in battle or in oar. Were he a Christian? God, what a warrior. <laughs> if only he were on our side. But he's not. And he comes face to face with Charlemagne. And I am looking for it. Oh, actually, can we talk about something else before that? 245. This specimen of a man, this awesome warrior, wants to rally the troops. We've all seen it, right? If you've seen, uh, some of you read Henry V with me. Maybe you've seen the, the, the movie, uh, Henry V goes out and gives this rousing speech to his troops. If you've seen Lord of the Rings, he's like, it will not be this day, you know? And so you do it, right? Because you got to fire people up. They're going to run probably headlong into death. And you got to sort of fire them up a little bit. And so this is, a, this is a literary idea that we fire up the troops. 
Well, I want you to listen to the two ways that the two leaders fire up their troops. In 245, Balagant fires up his troops. Strike, Paynham, strike. That's what you're here to do. I'll give you women, noble and fair of hue, honors and fiefs and lands I'll give to you. The Paynham's answer, our service is your due. So hard their strokes, the lances break in two. By hundred thousand, the swords flash into view. Grim is the battle and terrible and rude. He learns what war is who fights that battle through. What does Balagant promise everyone? Money, love, power. Money, money, women, possessions. And and how do they answer? I don't know. Maybe I'm reading into this. That our service is your due. They don't sound like, yeah, let's do it. It's like, yes, yes, we, we will obey you. Now, listen, read 246 with me. This is Charlemagne. The emperor now appeals to all the French. Barons, my lords, I love and trust you well. So many battles you fought in my defense, subdued such kings, conquered so many realms. Full well I know that I am in your debt for all I have, my body, lands, and wealth. Your sons, your heirs, your brothers now revenge that lately fought at Roncevaux and fell. Justly, you know, I fight the infidel. The French make answer, sir, that is truly said. What does he appeal to? Virtue. Virtue. And he's just like, and he's very personable. You can see that Harlan is very personable. He's just like, I'm sorry. I know this wolf. I know this is taking us so long, and y'all are like, just taxed out. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But we're almost there. Yeah. There. Yeah. He doesn't promise them loot. He says, Justly, you know, I fight the infidel. I, I'm right. I, I have justice on my side. We have justice on our side. That's all we need. And he doesn't, oh, I'll give you all sorts of stuff, which implies I have lots of stuff to give you. He starts, you know what? Everything I have, I'm in your debt for. You fought battles for me so that I could have it. They're very different. It's easy to miss, you know, when you're sort of barreling through the poem. And then you stop and you think, wow, they really talk to their men differently. I feel like there's a little conversation in the back with Jesse. Jesse can't even hear me because he's into this conversation so much. But we keep it. It's only half an hour. The mom thing. If someone's not bleeding or throwing up, it can wait for half an hour. Okay. Um, it's a huge antithesis. And you know, antithesis can be, we're, we're doing sort of in a sentence when I have you do your papers and we do this antithesis. It can be big. It can be a big antithesis. And that's a big one. Um, we already pretty much know who's going to come out on top. Um, but in 253, Balagant finally gets the memo. Um, uh, about two thirds of the way down. Balagant, sire, for you the day goes ill. Your son is lost. You have lost Malpremis. And Cannabius, your brother too, is killed. In 254, he finally wants someone to talk, the, talk straight. Quoth the emir, come here, Jean Glou, be frank. You are a brave and very prudent man on whose advice I've long been wont to act. How do they strike you, the Arabs and the Franks? Will this day give the victory to our hands? And he makes answer, you are dead, Balagant. <laughs> Not all your gods can save you from mishap. I wish somebody would have spoken straight to him before, but they do now. Okay. Um, 258, Balagant versus Charlemagne is where it starts, but we're set up for it in 257 where it says the wrongs with him, the rights with Charlemagne. And, um, let's actually look at 260. Quoth the emir, bethink thee, Charles, and see that thou repent what thou hast done to me. My son is slain. I know it was by thee. 
and on my lands thou wrongfully hast seized. Become my man, and I will be thy liege. Then come and serve me from here into the east. I'll give you a job, Charlemagne. Just come sign up with me. Quoth Carlon, nay, I'd hold it treachery. Never to Paynims may I show love or peace. Do thou confess the faith by God revealed. Take Christendom, and thy fast friend I'll be. The King Almighty then serve thou and believe. Quoth Balagant, thy sermon's but ill preached. Once more with swords they battle each to each. It is Charlemagne versus Balagant, but what else is it versus? It's my God versus your God. It's Christianity versus Islam. These are religions coming uh, head to head, face to face here. And God is involved because in 261, the third line from the bottom, but God wills not that he be or come and killed. Charlemagne. 263, the painims fly for God has willed it so. 265, last line, well speeds that man which hath God for his helper. They go to Saragossa in 266, and what do they do halfway through? They smash the idols, the images they smite, make a clean sweep of mummeries and lies, for Charles fears God and still to serve him strives. And then we have mixed feelings about this now, but uh, the bishops next the water sanctify, then to the font the Paynim folk they drive. They force them all to be baptized. This is something that we kind of look at each other and think, what? But back then this was not an abnormal thing. They take Bramamond, the queen, under their care, and... Um, it's time to go home. And you know, there's various places where this poem can end, right? It's like, oh, Roland's dead. That would be a terrible ending. Um, Charles came back and fought off the Saracen hordes. This is a better ending. But then we brought Balagant on the scene. Well, now we can't leave him there. So now we have to have a showdown between Charlemagne and Balagant, and that could be an ending. But we haven't dealt with Ganelon, which reminds me of your papers. You are working on, should treason be a capital offense? Um, I don't want to. I don't want to derail us right here. <clears throat> but remind me if if anybody wants to talk to me about your paper. If you just can't think of ideas, I'll try to save a few minutes at the end. You know, and we'll bring it up, or you can talk to me afterwards. How convenient for you. Excellent. I look forward to seeing a very well-supported position in your paper. Um, okay. They bring Ganelon out. They bring Ganelon out. What does Ganelon argue? What is his defense? You want to do it, Ethan? Yes. I wasn't, I wasn't committing treason. I was just fighting against, well, Roland. I was just trying to fight against Roland. I'm not committing treason. Not sure that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, this is not a very good argument, I feel like. But he does. He says in 272, um, Charlemagne presents the charges. He went with me and with my host to Spain. By 20,000, he's had my Frenchman slain. Also my nephew, whom you'll not see again. And Oliver, the courteous lord and brave. All the 12 peers for money he betrayed. I'd scorn, quoth Gwenys, not to admit that same. He does say, oh, yeah, I did that. I, I, I Yeah, I, I had him killed. Roland, now, remember at the beginning how they just don't seem to get along at all, Roland and, and, and Ganelon? Roland had wronged me in wealth and in estate. Therefore, I plotted his death and his disgrace. Ganelon says Roland cheated him out of land and money? All of his lawyers are like, stop talking. But I deny treason against the state. This calls for much debate. This calls for much debate, say the Franks. 
So, so then in 273, here's the thing about um, a little over halfway down. Roland, his nephew, hated and did me wrong, doomed me to die horribly by a plot. Okay, A, Ganelon, are you still having that problem with lying that you picked up in Saragossa? Or B, is he referring to having him sent on the embassy? You know, nominating him for that embassy that the last guys who did that didn't come back from? Doomed me to die horribly by a plot. Then he says, I was made envy, envoy, sorry, to Count Marsilion, but used my wits and so came safely off. Vengeance I took, he says, but treason I did not. So here's the deal. If this was confusing at all, um, I say, Charlemagne says, I say you did it. Ganelon says, I say I didn't do it. Well, what are we going to do? Well, Ganelon doesn't seem to be much of a fighter, but he's got a relative named Pinabel, who's apparently like the Incredible Hulk or something. He's enormous. It's very strong. But Charlemagne is the king. He shouldn't have to fight in this sort of battle. So a guy named Theory stands up. You know, everyone else says, oh, maybe Ganelon's right. Maybe he didn't do anything. I'm just going to go over here out of the way. I don't really want to fight that guy. Maybe we'll just, you know, say, Ganelon, don't do that again. <laughs> don't do that again. But Theory says, no, I'll do it. This man is rotten to the core. He's wicked and God will judge right. So we're probably all familiar with this, this medieval, uh, like a trial by combat, trial by ordeal sort of thing, that God will protect the right side. This is what we trust um, when you go into one of these battles. So Theory is not afraid of the Hulk because he's got God on his side. He believes his side is right. Sorry, I just ruined the tone with those things, don't I? Um, and he says, I'll fight it out. So Pinabel and Ganelon have 30 other guys that have stood up. They've given surety. All right. Like we, we say, you know, we'll step into the fight if Pinabel is, is wounded in some way. We, we will stand up for Ganelon. Theory is a lot, I mean, Charlemagne and theory. And they fight it out. Um, and of course, theory wins. Um, in 277, uh, this is theory speaking. Even if Roland did Gwynny some disservice, your officers are sacred in their persons, and to betray him was treachery and murder. It was to you, sir, Gwynny was false and perjured. When he had your men killed, he attacked you, Charlemagne. That's the justice of my side and I will stand up for it. So um, Theory beats Pinabel, and um, listen to the end of 288. They are going to, um, well, first of all, no, first of all, they take the 30. Uh, yeah, oh, oh yeah, oh no, it's, it's bad. So they take the 30. Um, a hundred sergeants hail away the whole crew. Each of the 30 is hanged up in a noose. Treason destroys itself and others too. So the 30 that stood up. And the footnote, if you have the same footnote, it says that is not ordinary medieval practice to slaughter the, the sureties, the people that stood up on the side. Now, would anyone like to describe how Ganelon meets his ugly death? Because Ethan's very excited about it. So very excited about it. It's 289. Shall I read it? You do it. Do it. I, that's why I'm, I'm giving you the bait there. <laughs> you wanted it. from the rock sockets clean his blood runs bright upon the grassy green Ganelon's death so perish all his breed twere wrong that treason should live to boast him. oh but I'm gonna I'm gonna add we got it we got to do the up the the beginning so to this end they order up four steeds 
and bind him to them by the hands and feet. High metaled stallions they are exceeding fleet. Four sergeants take them and urge them at full speed towards a mare running loose in a field. I'm going to tie each of your limbs to a separate horse and then send them running off a late after a lady horse. Good luck with that. It's not going to end well. No. Um, so you might remember that eight phases of, of the Song of Roland picture I brought. And it had in the upper right hand corner of the picture, it had the guy laid on the ground spread out with his arms and legs spread out. That was them tying him to the horses. That would have been creative. And he would have been useful as well. As... <sighs> All right. So I got to read the end because I don't know. I just, I always get to the end of this and I don't know what to think. The emperor now has ended his assize, which means his, you know, his court. With justice done, his great wrath satisfied, and Brahma Manda brought to the fold of Christ. The day departs, and evening turns to night, the king's abed in vaulted chamber high. Saint Gabriel comes, God's courier to his side. Up, Charles, assemble thy whole imperial might. With force and arms unto Elbira ride. Needs must thou succor King Vivian where he lies, at Imphi, his city, besieged by Paynim tribes. There for thy help, the Christians call and cry. Small heart had Carlon to journey and to fight. God saves, the, says the king. How weary is my life. He weeps. He plucks his flowing beard in white. Damn. It's depressing. It never ends for Charlemagne, does it? There's always someone else that needs his help. And he will go because that's who he is. But it never ends. Now, the plot of this, the plot of the story of this poem thickens here with this last line. Here ends the jest Taroldus would recite. The end. So. I'm going to read to you what Dorothy um, Sayers, the uh, translator, says in the introduction. Okay. And who was the poet? Of all the tantalizing riddles in literature, the last line of the Song of Roland may bear away the bell. For it dangles a name before us, only to twitch it away just as it seems within our grasp. And here she writes it in, um, it's it's medieval French, but it's very Latin-y. Si faux la geste que turoldus declinet. Unhappily, nobody knows what declinet means, which turoldus composed or recited or merely in the capacity of a scribe copied out, um, or that the remainder of the poem is lacking. Does it not stop there? Here it just ends. I was copying it. Nobody knows. But I love this. According to two British historians, a song of Roland was chanted before the Battle of Hastings to William's troops, and the Bayou Tapestry has a picture of a minstrel, and it calls him Turoldus. Is this a guy from William the Conqueror? Did Nobody knows. Who is Taroldus? What does Declinet mean? Does it mean the rest of it's gone? Does it end there? Did he copy it? Did he write it? Did he sing it? It is a mystery of history. We do not know. We do not know. So I, I would like it if it didn't end there because it's just, oh, Charlemagne's just, oh, I'm sick of life laying in his bed. Now I got to get up and do it again tomorrow. That just isn't the way I like it to end. But that's what we have. Yes. Song of Roland and Roland and Ganelon, these characters pop up in later literature just over and over and over again. So I'm glad we could share walking through it together. Next week, we are going to completely shift gears. Still got battle and war going on. That's the only that's the only um, thing that's that's the same. But would everybody please look in your reading guide on page 49? Um, I am going to just go through, this is, this is an outline almost just for me.
okay? I'm going to give you the Mrs. Ferguson's Quick Guide to the Crusades, um, the first three crusades, because what we're going to do is we're going to read about the fourth crusade. It's a little different. Um, you guys all probably know something about the crusades already, that um, in Europe, um, they decided to go east and fight fight the Muslims who had taken the Holy Land. Um, so what caused it? I'm, I'm just going to roughly follow my outline and embellish it. First of all, the Turks. The Turks came in, took Jerusalem in 1070. Jerusalem had belonged to Muslims before. Harun al-Rashid had been sending messages, remember, back and forth to Charlemagne and sent him an elephant, apparently. and but they were cool with people from the West visiting Jerusalem, visiting the holy sites. They didn't harass them. They weren't mean to them. Christian pilgrims were just not harming anybody and we didn't harm them. That was the, that was the way it was in the East. The Turks didn't feel that way. The Turks were pretty rough and, and people started going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem or Bethlehem or wherever. And then they would come back and say, it's really bad. It's very dangerous there now. They're not kind to Christians. You, you go at risk of your own life. And this started stirring up feelings in Europe that we need to do something about this. Another problem was the Byzantine Empire was on its last legs. Um, it's going to hang out for another 400 years. So last legs, I use the term loosely. But uh, fighting inside. Um, and in 1054, the churches split. The Eastern Church and the Western Church went their own ways, and there just wasn't a lot of coming and going anymore. You know, Notker, I didn't really get to read this part to you, but Notker tells the story of envoys from Charlemagne that were visiting Constantinople and going back and forth. That sort of travel slowed down a lot um, because they just they they were arguing over some theological issues and also just some mean, mean people in both churches. Um, so finally, uh, though it got so bad, the Turks were surrounding Constantinople and the Emperor Alexius sent a message to the Pope, sent a message to kings in the West and said, we're under attack and we need help. This was a hard thing for them to do, I'm sure, because they really didn't, they really had a grudge against the, the Catholic Church in the West, um, but they needed the help. Um, in the meantime, cities like Venice, some of the, the very wealthy Italian cities would really like to get their hands on some trade routes through the East. The Turks had cut off their silks and spices and gold and all the things they were importing. And I'd like to get a piece of that pie. Maybe we could go over there and, you know, carve out a place for ourselves. So all these things came together. And, um, and so the First Crusade uh, started 1095. Pope was Urban II and he gave a speech in which he said, we will rest that land from a wicked race. Undertake this journey eagerly for the remission of your sins and be assured of the reward of imperishable glory in the kingdom of heaven. If you take the cross, which is what they call doing it, I paint a red cross on my tunic, you know, on my shield, and it's just, I'm a crusader. If you take the cross, I, I will I give you a pardon for all your sins. And you will be a martyr if you if you die there. And they say the crowd yelled out, Deus Wolt, God wills it. It's God's will. People started scrambling. We go home. We get our sons and our horses and get that armor out and polish it up and sharpen our swords and, and we're ready to go. Um, unfortunately, they didn't organize themselves very well. So a guy named, you know, when your leaders are Peter the Hermit and Walter the Penniless, sure they're, sure they're okay guys, you know, but they just don't, that doesn't ring with confidence for me, but they felt like it was taking too long. So they just basically set out with 12,000 people, only eight of them being knights. Just like people just crowded, let's go, let's go, let's go take Jerusalem. Dude, you've never fought in your life. You don't know what you're doing. So they they made their way across Europe by pillaging and stealing food and attacking Jews. And then uh, they all got killed. 
in the East. They didn't do anything. Um, the Franks got together, uh, moved to the East, took Nicaea, took Antioch, took Jerusalem, 70,000 Muslims killed. And if you would just turn the page for me, you will see a map. And this is a map of the Crusader states. Um, the, the places shaded are the kingdoms that they set up. And each one, it tells what years it, it, it was in existence. They, they built castles. You can go east and still go visit the Crusader castles. And, and they set up basically kingships over there. I just, I took this away from the Muslims and now it's mine. Unfortunately, the emperor in Constantinople was under the impression that everything the Crusaders recovered would be returned to him because that was originally his territory. Not so much. They said, you know what, we're just going to keep this. And so for, you know, 100, 150 years, there were these Crusader states. Okay, that's the first crusade. And at the end of my, uh, the bottom of page 49, I talk about those, those Latin kingdoms. Okay, so on page 50, Second Crusade. Um, the Muslims uh, took back all of these Christian kingdoms. Uh, they stirred up the King of France, but I'm just gonna skip over the rest of that. It was just a, it was a dud. They fought with each other. The army broke up and people got very cynical. Why, why, why would we lose? But why would God let us lose? We're right. Doesn't the right side always win? Third Crusade. Third Crusade is the famous one. It's Richard the Lionhearted and uh, Frederick Barbarossa, who drowned in a river on his way there. He was like in his 60s, which doesn't sound so old to me anymore, but he was a little past crusading age. Uh, Philip Augustus of France, showed up outside of Jerusalem and nobody listened to him. Nobody did anything. And then Richard came and everybody listened to him. So Philip said, I'm going to take my toys and go home. But Richard did take, um, they did not take uh, Jerusalem. He um, took several cities, but it ended in dissension. And that's, that's the history of the Crusades up to the point that you're going to start reading. Okay. So it's been a mixed bag. They took over some land. They lost the land. They often fight with each other. It's hard to get the French and the English and the Germans to all agree and Italians to agree with each other. It's like, you're, you're, you know, your sandwich is bigger than mine. I'm going home with sometimes petty things, annoying things. But in 1202, they decided they wanted to go on crusade again. Yes, Alex. was marching uh, like a duke from, I don't know, Austria or something. I don't know, something like that. And this duke had a big army. I mean, he was very much needed mm -hmm. um, for this crusade. But, but Richard said, I am a king, so I'm going to be at the front of the line. You can be right behind me, though. And the duke's like, no, I want to be in front. It's my army's doing this. And then the Duke's like, you know what? I'm going to go home. I'm going to take my armies and I'm going to go home. That's what they did. It's just like toddlers. I will take my toys and go home if you don't play it my way. I want you to keep that in mind as you read the next book because it's you're going to all over the place. You're going to see it. So the book we're going to read. Now, you might have a book that looks really big like mine, but because of time constraints, this is the story of two different crusades. And the, the one um, the, the one that St. Louis, St. Louis of France went on, it's really, really long. And it's not very interesting, I think. We are only reading the one by the man named Geoffrey of Villahardouin, and I'm probably butchering that. It is the, what is it, the title of it in my book? The Conquest of Constantinople. All right. What have I said it in how you've got your book open still? What is the title? The Conquest of Constantinople. I've written that by Villa Harduin. So you're not, we're not reading this whole book. So when you go home and pick up the book, don't pass out. 
Don't swoon. Um, I would like you to read chapters one through seven. I sat down and read one. I read the first half of that last night in one sitting. I mean, I've read it numerous times, so um, it's not going to take you that long. But I would like to point out that if you have the issue that I have, there are two amazing maps in the front, towards the front. There's a map of basically the whole Mediterranean, and then there's an inset on the next page, and it's a close-up of the area around Constantinople. And it helps a lot because this guy talks about you know, where the troops were located and everything. It's also instructive to see where Venice is located in relationship to all the rest of this. Um, Jeffrey went on this crusade. This is a book written by an eyewitness. And you will see his name. If it says Jeffrey of Villa Hardwin in the text, he's talking about himself. He's talking about himself. And he even says, I was present at the conferences that I'm describing in this book. I was there. I was in that council. <laughs> I know what happened. So um, we're going to spend two weeks reading this, we're reading the first half. But don't worry, we're not, we're not going to read the, the join bell one. Um, I thought about it, and it would just push us too fast. Um, so chapters one through seven for next week, I would like you to finish your Should Treason Be a Capital Offense? And we're still going to use antithesis and parallelism. But I'm not adding anything new, okay? Is there any final comment or question or anything? No? All right, then you guys can go. Have a nice lunch, and I'll see you next week.